श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओम श्रुतिस्मृतिपुराणल नमा भगवत्दशंकोकशंक अप्रमस्तस्म भगवते सुप्तेशु बहुजागर सुमेधायाति सुमेधायाबलाजनो य Sumedha, the intelligent one. Okay. Uh, sometimes what happens is uh, people compare themselves with other people around. This question comes in the satsang also all the time. So all the relatives and friends, the circle, big circle of relatives and friends, nobody is interested in Vedanta. I am the only one. Who, who is interested in Vedanta? And they question me. They make fun of me. So what should we do? This kind of a question comes. So it is, society is like that. All around you, you find people who are in the grip of Ajnana. They are inadvert. In, they are inadvertent. It doesn't occur to them. For example. Money is not security. This simple truth does not occur to people of the world. They believe that money is security. Money is security or risk. You tell me. Suppose you have a bundle of notes in your pocket. Will it secure you or will it put you at risk? It puts you at risk. And in the family, you collect all the property and money around you. Everybody around you in the family, every member of the family will fight against you. Every member, son, daughter, brother, sister, father, mother, all these relations will crumble, and only money takes precedence over everything else. That is how the world is. People are like that. In the family, within the same family, uh, the others are not interested in getting, gaining jnana and all that. They are very busy in their samsaric pursuits, the worldly pursuits. They are very much worldly-minded. And then uh, you you come to some of these religious-minded people. They are very much devoted to God, worship this and that. Lots of rituals they will be performing, and they scold you. Hey, why don't you perform rituals? What kind of thing it is? Shankaracharya asked you to worship Chindi. Shankaracharya uh, asked you to worship Chindi. Uh, you don't find anywhere in the Brahm Bhashyas, in the Prasthanatraya Bhashya, even the mention of Chindi is not there. Chindi is what? It came uh, from Markandeya Purana. Markandeya Purana is not written by Vyasa Maharshi. It is written by Markandeya Maharshi. And uh, its date is also known. So all this worship... Of the Shakti in the form of Chandi, Chamundi, etc., it came sometime in the medieval period, and it is taken up by some of these Shankaracharyas, and it was made part and parcel of some of the Pethas. That has nothing to do with the Shankaras uh, Bhashyas. But now, what uh, there is a, a, a shift has taken place in the society. Shankara was converted into a religious icon. Shankara is not a religious person. He is a spiritual person. He is a philosopher. He is not a ritualist. But Shankara, he is made into a religious icon. What about Christianity? The same thing. Jesus Christ is not a religious person. He is a spiritual. He was a spiritual person. But the Vatican converts Jesus Christ into an icon. And so he has used his blood to wash our sins. Like that, they come out with some very odd kind of uh, opinions and statements. 
which can only have, which only have to be believed, nothing else. You cannot do anything with those things except to believe in them. You believe them. Just nod your head and gulp it down and believe it and don't question it. You should not question it. This is how a, a great philosopher, saint, is converted into a religious icon. You go to Brindavan, you don't find the book of Gita there. Gita book you won't find in Brindavan, many ashrams are there. You enter into an ashram and see whether they have Bhagavad Gita book. They will not have. They won't have Bhagavad Gita book. They don't study Bhagavad Gita. They only study some stories, mythological stories about Sri Krishna. Nobody teaches Gita in Vrindavan. Nobody talks of Gita. They talk of Radha and Sri Krishna and then dance, Rasa Leela, this, that, all kinds of things they talk. They talk everything except Gita. Therefore, Sri Krishna is made into an icon that represents a very different kind of religion which has uh, absolutely got nothing to do with the vision of Gita. So this kind of uh, a degradation in the social life, it happens over millennia, over, uh, over centuries, this happens. So you can see this very, in a very stark way, very, very compelling way, you can see this uh, change, this modification. You can see in the, in the case of Bhagavan Buddha, you can see what he teaches in Dhammapadam has nothing to do with various sects of Buddhism. Some points may coincide here and there, but uh, every sect to its own way. And adopts Buddha as an icon in select points. Like that, there are dozens of schools of Buddhism. And same thing with Christ. There are many denominations among Christians. They all have Christ as the icon. They do not follow what Christ says. They follow their own belief systems which were developed over centuries. Same is the case with Rama. Same is the case with Shankara. You can see this in a very stark fashion. You cannot miss it. Shankara, if you go to a matha that uh, exposes Shankara, you don't find any Bhashya teachings there. They don't promote Bhashya teaching also. They don't teach Bhashya to anybody. They study them. Some of them study, but they close the door before starting the study and they study for a fixed time like one hour or so, Ahmar Mahasmi, and then close the book and forget about Brahma and all that. Start a worship of uh, um, tantric nature. Therefore, you cannot go by the, uh, the atmosphere that is around you. All around you, there is uh, the ignorance, uh, the inadvertence ruling the roost all around you. So, you should not compare yourself with uh, the surroundings and people around, the people in the family. Nobody is interested in the family, only one person is interested in Vedanta. All others are interested in money only. They are not interested in Vedanta and all that. You know what they do? A person takes to sannyasa and becomes acharya and uh, these family members, they come and they take advantage of this acharya. Uh, so the acharya collects money and all that. Therefore, family members uh, look for it. That is how it happens. This is a very funny world, I tell you. Therefore, you, you understand you are surrounded by the worldly people. You cannot have an atmosphere where you are surrounded by visionary people. You will not have. Only this kind, only you know, everybody around you is a worldly person. And uh, you have to look at that situation and uh, then take courage, have a bless all of them, don't grudge them. Bless all of them. Don't expect them to come and join you. Don't do that. My wife should join me. The husband comes to Vedanta class and wants his wife to join him. She won't. And wife comes and husband has to join. He won't. So these things won't happen. It is, 
it is a, it is for you you alone you are alone in this pursuit in this vedantic pursuit everybody is alone you cannot have group pursuit so you are alone even teaching is also it is a one to one correspondence it's not that one teacher this is the model which is a wrong model i always point out this model you pay attention to that don't get carried away all the way by that model namely the classical or traditional guru surrounded by a large crowd of shishyas that is not a good model you are not that is a religious leader he the gurus all the gurus are religious leaders and in modern times modern times means in the last half century or century so all the acharyas of vedanta so what they did is uh, it is a question of expediency so all the acharyas of vedanta except a few here and there all of them 99% of them have become religious leaders all of them they do not uh, keep that status of being uh, imparting the wisdom the the precept to the seeking students only that much nothing more and uh, that uh, sharing the vision is always a one to one correspondence it is even when 10 people sit before this uh, teacher it is always one to one correspondence like a mathematics class in the university so it is not like uh, one guru the religious leader having a flock of 10000 or 1000 shishyas that model is a wrong model it doesn't fit into vedanta therefore understand all this the philosophers the great philosophers of buddha shankara christ mahavira etc they were all converted into religious icons which they are not and uh, people they follow the religion only they want to believe they don't want to think in fact when you don't want to think the option that is available to you is to believe there is the only option ever. people take that option and they love to remain in the samsara they are not in a big hurry to get out of samsara even if they are informed of uh, jnanam vedanta this and that even when they are informed they will put it for a future date they reserve it for a future date and uh, so they are not in a hurry to get this wisdom and step out of the time i say you can you, you can step out of the time psychological time they are not interested in uh, stepping out of the psychological time they want to stay in psychological time it feels very good and very enjoyable till they get a hit so therefore this is how the world is and you are surrounded by them apramattaha pramatteshu they are all living a life of samsara caught in the throes of the worldliness and bound you stand up like spartacus <laughs> you know i hope you understand so among the among thousands of slaves the spartacus the one by name spartacus i i hope i am saying the right name he stands up and he declares a war against slavery similarly you get up stand up and declare a war against worldliness and come out of this inadvertence even when all people around you are very much in the bondage of samsara they allow to be there you see people who are accustomed to bondage they don't want to step out of the bondage they they like to remain in bondage this happens the world is like that if you go to a jail what they call jail in this country and they call penitentiary elsewhere in north america if you give them an option all of you can walk out on payroll today this moment we are declaring all of you can walk out on payroll go open the gates and come back after 15 minutes you will find quite a few of them still sitting there only waiting for the evening dinner and when you ask them why are you still here we open the doors so you can get out no we don't want to get out we want to stay here that is human nature therefore 
don't compare with others don't uh, try to uh, make a group with family members and all that stand alone you know what you are single you are never associated with others only you imagine that you are uh, are related you are not related so they say uh, the kumbhamela example they give and the banks of yamuna or ganga there is a kumbhamela program going on one lakh devotees have assembled not one devotee is connected to another devotee every devotee is by himself or by herself that is the world the world is like kumbhamela so all everybody is on his own or her own so understand that take courage move forward apramattaha pramatteshu satsu and all around you there ignorant samsari people are there you stand up and fight against this inadvertence okay supteshu bahu jagaraha all are sleeping you alone sit awake fully awake bahu jagaraha so sometimes what happens is eh, we get up at early morning brahma mohurta you have to do japam therefore get up at 3:30 still there is sleep in you but uh, you take a vow to get up take a bath take a mala and do japam and while doing japam go on dozing and uh, so half sleep and suddenly you fall and uh, for the, because of that fall you wake up and shake the head and again do japam and then again fall so you are neither sleeping nor awake don't be like that go to sleep and wake up when uh, you have slept enough and when there is no more sleep in your eyes you wake up and then start the japa it should be like that and uh, for japa you don't need a muhurta and all that this muhurta is a, is a confusion thing it is what is the muhurta for lunch 12 o'clock what is the muhurta for breakfast 7:30 these are ashram timings i am telling you that is muhurta there is no other muhurta eh? so this muhurta is a funny notion somebody started it and people are caught in it so the one who started all this confusion there is a name for that one the original mischief maker there is always an original mischief maker whether he may belong to this century or four centuries back there is always a original mischief maker what is shri krishna dancing with girls that is what shri krishna represents this is the mischief and the original mischief maker according to vivekananda was in the 12th century or 13th century somebody not recognized no need to say, do research and find out who started all this because it is not uh, the right thing and you just ignore all that don't pay attention all, to all that all of that must be symbolic every one of the stories about shri krishna is symbolic every one of them okay uh, therefore you remain apramatta don't lose heart that all around you there are people who are in inadvertent and then when everybody is sleeping you remain fully awake here sleeping slumber represents ignorance or inadvertence tamada here i have a question if you have if you see the murti the idol of dakshina murti it is made in a particular way so dakshina murti and then under his one of the feet under one of his feet the left foot or right foot he sits in a particular posture in which one of the feet is bent and put on the thigh of the other and another foot it stands on the ground under the under that foot there is one demon a small guy that is how the idol is somebody made the idol there is an idol somewhere it must have been made 500 years back or 1000 years back not that brahma the hiranyagarbha made that idol and put it there you cannot say that right therefore that idol is like that 
And this guy who is kept under check, under the foot by the Kshanamurti, his name is Apasmara. Not Apasmara. You have to put a Dergham also. Apasmara. So Apasmara, the, the evil spirit, was kept under check by the Kshanamurti. It stands for, uh, it is a symbolic thing. It stands for something, a spirit there, not physical. So, uh, and uh, the Apasmara, does he have a dagger in his hand too? Maybe, maybe. Dagger means he will hurt you. The Apasmara will hurt you. Therefore, he holds a dagger and he will... Uh, um, put into your, put it into your heart unless you are very careful about the apasmara. But fortunately, that Dakshinamurti keeps the apasmara under his foot. That is the symbolism. And apasmara stands for ignorance. Now the question is, uh, can apasmara be pramada? Yeah. Why? Why not? Because the smara, smara, smara means remembrance. And the remembrance is pushed aside. That is inadvertence. You do not remember the right thing in the right time or at the right place. You do not remember. Either you don't remember at all, or even if you remember, you remember at a wrong time and wrong place. Never the, the right time and right place. This is the absence of smara, or absence of smara is a smara. Okay? Therefore, you see, it depends upon the suffix. For some suffixes, it remains as a smara only. So it doesn't get elongated. That upadha ach a. It remains a rasvam shat. But some of the suffixes becomes dirgha. You cannot make the distinction because both kinds of suffixes end up as a a. Therefore, smara a smara. Smar a smara. Both end up the same way. And both forms are valid. Both are valid. Therefore, apasmara, it is called apasmaraha. So it stands for the pramada. Uh, so, Dakshinamurti visualizes Rishi's awareness. There are Rishis around Dakshinamurti, four of them. They are all very awake. Therefore, they represent. The apasmara, not only apasmara, this is the realization of the truth, they are the rishis, and then uh, Dakshinamurti blessed them, helped them to realize the truth. And who is Dakshinamurti? Their own atma. Tasmai Shri Guru Murthy Namayidam Shri Dakshinamurti. Tasmai is atma. Dakshinamurti in the form of atma blesses them. All blessings come from only one source, and that is your atma. Therefore, that uh, apasmara of that uh, representation of God corresponds to, indeed corresponds to uh, pramada, okay, that is settled. Therefore, uh, when everybody is in slumber, slumber uh, stands for ig uh, ignorance. Mandukya says like that, in Mandukya, so, nidra tatma majanataha. Anyatha granhata svapnaha nidra tatva majanataha. In the first Agama Prakarnam itself, you come across this karika by Gaudapada Acharya. You do not know the truth, that is slumber. You are confused, that is dream. So now what we have in life? Slumber and a dream. These two we have. Then, uh, if uh, they are symbolized like that, then the waking state symbolizes self-realization or knowledge of the truth. Therefore, to understand the truth, that is waking state, you are confused, that is a dream state, you are ignorant, that is deep sleep, that is the symbolism. Okay, therefore, supteshu bahu jagaraha. Everybody is in deep sleep, means they are uh, totally in the fold of, or in the hold of ignorance, or inadvertence. Let them. There will be a time for everybody. Everybody has to wake up in his own or her own time. That is how it works. There is nothing like it. Early or late. 
you cannot talk in terms of coming to vedanta early or unfortunately coming to vedanta late all that language is not valid because the understanding is timeless you see the part do you see it early or late the question doesn't arise you see it you see it you don't see it in time if you see it in time it can be early or it can be late but you don't see it in time understanding is not in time it is timeless kriya is in time so you can finish the kriya early or you can prolong it late all those things are valid for action rjnanam time itself doesn't apply therefore people complaining oh i missed a lot of time you did not miss because the vision is timeless so where is the question of missing time that's so why even shri krishna says asthitva syam antakale pi brahma nirvana murchati one moment before death you realize your true self you are liberated therefore it is not about time to come out of time therefore all everybody is sleeping means they are in, in deep ignorance deep sleep corresponds to deep ignorance nidra tatva majanata ha he doesn't know the truth of the self they identify with the body mind and they live the life of a isolated ego in a separate body that is how they live that is the life they live that is this slumber and now you wake up and wake up fully not half way some half kind of half waking up also is there these are all described he is half awake and half still sleeping so some kind of an intermediary between sleep and waking up don't be like that bahu i am explaining the word bahu bahu jagaraha you wake up fully means you understand the truth completely now you move forward in the path of self realization it is not a path but still it is presented as a path it is a metaphor everything is metaphor here and here he gives one small one aspect of an elaborate metaphor of the kathopanishad and gita this metaphor there are standard vedantic metaphors and upanishadic metaphors i remind you the kathopanishad metaphor so atmanam rathinam vidhi shariram ratham evatu you see the gita upadesha figures are there photographs and figures, not photographs and paintings what do you see in the gita upadesha painting the the instruction of gita as a painting what do you see you see a chariot and shri krishna and uh, with a whip in his hand and then arjuna very politely asking uh, waiting uh, or listening to what shri krishna is saying horses four or five they were fighting in milwaki whether it is four or five are what does it matter what does it matter it is a metaphor only they were fighting four or five the american who made uh, that uh, plaster of paris model so that is, he has a business american man he owns a workshop where he will make plaster of paris models or anything you give a, a drawing on paper he will make plaster of paris model first and based on that he will make metallic uh, idol also he will make that is his job and so these people went to him they wanted gita upadesha made and a big plaster of paris model so that they can keep it in the entrance of the temple the temple committee members took a resolution like that and passed the budget also and so went to him hired him and so they gave him the picture now for giving the they have to give one picture and so there are two pictures before them one is five horses picture another is four horses now they are fighting the committee is divided half way in the middle one half or four horses part of the committee five horses part then that person he wants his business he doesn't want to waste time with these guys so he said to do like this i'll make a model which can include the fifth horse if necessary or you can pull out the fifth horse if you don't like 
How is that idea? They said, okay, let us do that. But it will cost a thousand dollars extra. They have money. Temple people have plenty of money. Not an issue. <laughs> so, my father told me, never give money in the temple. Take money from temple. Somebody asked my father, how much you have put in the hundi? We don't give to Venkateshwara Swami. He has enough money. We take from him. He gives the travel expenses and some dakshina also to us. Then he told me, don't give to Venkateshwara Swami. Who are you to give to Venkateshwara Swami, you bacha? You take from him. I followed the same principle. We don't give to God. We take from God. God pays for our flight charge. God pays for our train charge. And God gives us some other expenses also. And some dakshina also. Take and come back. All devotees give money. <laughs> anyway, so this person, he, I will make it like that. He has got, uh, he has uh, jockeyed up his price by another thousand dollars. And he will make an additional piece with some screws. If you don't like it, you can pull it out. If you like it, you can fix it. These are all people. Now the American guy, he understood the spirit much better than all our temple committee members. I told you this example, how ignorant the people are. And uh, so the Gita model, there, uh, you don't worry about horses five or four. It doesn't matter, right? It is four or five, it doesn't matter. If you, if you examine a, a chariot or a cart drawn by horses, it cannot have five, it can only have four. How, how can you put five fifth hearts? Where will you put the fifth hearts? So to this side, to this side, that is how the chariots run. Four hearts are enough. No, no, but we have five sense organs. You can manage uh, for one heart uh, corresponds to two sense organs. But anyway, people are people. So this is the model. And uh, this is entirely symbolic. Students of Gita should understand that it is entirely symbolic. Shankara treated it as merely symbolic and he makes one statement, this is symbolic, put it aside. He doesn't comment upon the entire first chapter, he puts it aside. In the second chapter also, ten verses, he puts it aside. He doesn't comment, he doesn't want to put his energy into commenting on a metaphor, as if it is literally true. He starts his commentary from 2.11, Sri Bhagavan Vacha, there he comments. And there, while starting his commentary, he writes one sentence. Till now, the entire first chapter, and the 20, 10 verses of the second chapter, they represent only one thing, that there is a guy called Arjuna, he is unhappy and confused. So come on, how? That is the entire thing. Nothing more than that. Forget about uh, why Arjuna said that, why Sri Krishna said that. Don't start the psychoanalysis of Arjuna and Sri Krishna. Don't do that. Our friends are doing, our Vedanta Acharyas are doing the psychoanalysis of Sri Krishna and Arjuna for the last century, hundred years. And it did not end at. Even now they are still doing it. Don't do it. Ignore it. It is only a metaphor. In Gita also, it is a metaphor. You are Arjuna. The metaphor is originally from Kathopanishad. So, Atmanam Rathinam Vidhi, you are the master of the chariot. I gave you some background about the metaphor. You are the master of the chariot. God is not the master of the chariot. You are the master of the chariot. Uh, understanding should be there. You are the master. Whose chariot it is? Body is the Shariram Rathamevatu. It is your body. You made it, it is a custom made, it is like a Rolls Royce car, it's a custom made body for you. You provided all the details of the body that has to be custom made for you, and the Bhagavan made it and handed over to you. That is your custom. Custom made means from your own karma, from your own vasanas you have created this body for yourself. Therefore, you are the master of the chariot. 
But then who drives the chariot? Not you. You don't drive the chariot. Shrotrasya Shrotram Jakshasya who Bhagavan drives the chariot. Okay? And that's why in the charioteer means the one who drives the chariot, right? So in that place you find Shri Krishna. And Bhagavan is compared with Buddhi. Buddhintu Sarathim Vidhi. The intellect drives the chariot. Bhagavan will keep aside for the present. Buddhintu Sarathim Vidhi. Bhagavan is Atma. Okay? So then what about the horses? Horses are sense organs. Now four, four you make it five. One horse stands for two sense organs. Like uh, mouth stands for two organs. It is taste buds and it is also speech. It stands for two, not an issue. Therefore, uh, one horse stands for two sense organs. You can fix that also if you wish. Even matter. So the horses are the sense organs. But then uh, the paths on which the horses run Vishayam Steshu Gocharam. So the eyesight, it traverses the field of forms and colors. The faculty of hearing, it traverses the field of sounds. Like that, the five sense organs traverse the five fields of the five sense objects. Therefore, the certain subjects are the five Shabdas, Parsha, Rupa, Rasa, Gandha. Now, you see, these horses have become very weak, Durbala. Why a sense organ becomes weak? Because you are overusing it. Why the mind becomes extremely tired? Because you are not giving enough rest to do it. You are putting it to um, hyper uh, use, hyper thinking, you hyperactivity. Hyperactivity of the mind is considered a disease. So mind becomes stressed out, worn out, and sick when uh, you allow the you put the mind into hyperactivity, which is in the form of agitation and restlessness. Mind is also an organ, that's why I said it. But here we are looking at the sense organs. Suppose you use taste buds continuously from morning to evening. Go on munching something or the other. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. And in between snacking goes continuously on something or the other. Some snack is sitting in the pocket. Pull it out and put it in the mouth and go on munching, eating. You do that, then there are very strict laws that govern the functioning of these sense organs. And according to that last, when you overuse a particular organ, it loses its vitality and it becomes weak and sick. Therefore, the, the taste words, they become sick in the sense that unless you put so much sugar into the dish, you cannot taste, it doesn't taste. The taste buds are uh, accustomed to or uh, habituated to a uh, kind of a uh, uh, kind of excessive uh, taste, extreme taste, spice, extreme. It is like uh, firing bullets upon the taste buds, and then sugar, extreme. So simple water, if you drink, it tastes sweet. Pure water tastes sweet, but we will not be able to recognize or taste that sweetness because our taste buds are accustomed to excessive sweetness in the form of adding a lot of sugar to the dishes. So when you eat lots of sweets continuously, day after day, week after week, a stage comes when a simple fruit, which has its own natural sweetness, you taste it, you will find it bald in taste. You don't like the taste. Hey, there is no taste in it. Our friends, uh, there is this uh, uh, fruit. They cut the fruit, add uh, uh, mirchi powder and salt to it and eat. You add mirchi powder and salt to the fruit? Why do you need mirchi powder and salt for eating the fruit? Gava fruit. That is what they do. Why should they do it? Because 
the fruit has uh, some mild taste and their taste buds are accustomed to extreme tastes or severe taste. This is how the taste buds become weak and they lose their ability, their sensitivity, they lose. You constantly use fragrances, your nose becomes uh, stuffy and your lungs also get coated by all these uh, fragrance molecules, volatile molecules and uh, you will have a so, uh, problem with reference to respiration and all that. Okay? Therefore, uh, don't go for the perfumes. These are all synthetic perfumes, uh, organic esters, don't go for all that. There is a natural perfume in the nature. When you go to, the, uh, go to a, um, a garden for walking, you can appreciate the natural perfume of grass, trees and plants and flowers. There is natural fragrance all around. You should be able to enjoy that. Whereas if you use lots of perfumes constantly, you will lose that sensitivity of the nose. And the nose for many people, they get allergic reactions. Even my nose is like that, not because of perfumes, but for some different reason. So it is stuffy, and uh, so uh, you don't uh, get any perfume and all that. So it becomes uh, sick. Then eyesight, faculty of hearing, these are all, these all become weak because of excessive use. Why are they used excessively? Because you are attached to the sense pressures too much. So don't do that. Don't do that. When the horses become weak, they are not willing to run. Then uh, the charioteer, what they will do? He gives up the horses and uh, goes by um, jogging or running or brisk walking. He goes by his way. He just ignores these horses. That is the metaphor. Okay. What is the meaning of giving up the horses? Means don't pay attention to these sense organs. Give up this job of engaging one or the other sense organ with the sense object all the time during the waking state. So there is a thing called a couch potato TV in which you sit in a lazy boy sofa, means the sense of touch is uh, satiated. It is addressed and then you watch the TV and uh, with a lot of sound, not caring for the disturbance created to the neighbor. So in which the eyesight and the audio visual, both the sense organs are gratified and then you will be eating chips which have a lot of spice and salt, gratifying the taste buds and watching the TV. So four sense organs. Put some, put some artificial or synthetic perfume there. So five cents organs are taken care of. While sitting, this is couch potato. Uh, couch, you sit, eat potato chips, watch TV uh, with a loud sound, have some perfumes going on. And so now all the five cents organs are engaged. That is the formula for disaster. Don't do that. Leave the sense organs alone. Eh? So you are an intelligent person. You see, it is possible not to fall into the well by jumping into it. But it is never possible to save it from suffering if you become a victim of worldly desires or sense pleasures. So you have to give up the sense pleasures. This I have discussed already. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I have discussed this topic adequately one time. But then Bhagavan Buddha talks of it in a beautiful metaphor. Therefore, I will briefly touch this topic. Yeah, so you give up. So do you entertain worldly attachments in your heart? Hmm? And uh, you fondly and willingly entertain attachments to the worldly things in your heart, you are making a big mistake, please be warned.
exhorted. A warning is being given to you. Pay attention to this warning. You, you are nourishing a poisonous cobra in your arms. And it will hurt you. You are feeding a poisonous cobra in your arms with milk. That is what you are doing. So are you feeding so many forms and colors to the eyes? Are you feeding all kinds of sounds to the ears? Are you feeding all kinds of food to the taste buds? Are you supplying all kinds of perfumes and fragrances to the nose? So, and then comforts, other kinds of comforts to the sense of touch. You are nursing a poisonous cobra in the form of sense organs with milk, which stands for the sense pleasures. And it will hurt you. It will extract very severe price from you in life. Never do this mistake. Leave the sense organs alone. Don't hit war. They, they do not take you. No, no, they are horses. They will take me to joy or happiness. No. They are not horses capable of taking you to that uh, lasting or timeless true happiness. They cannot. They are very weak horses. They cannot take you to self-realization, to your goal. So just give them up. So what happens is, uh, people should understand, uh, when there is a craving in your uh, consciousness, craving for any worldly thing, for anything for that matter, when there is craving for the outer thing uh, that blocks all deeper experience, what is the deeper experience? Experiencing yourself as the pure awareness, that is the deeper experience. The pure sense of being, aham, I am, is the pure sense of being. It is not the me and mine syndrome of the brain cells. That is corruption. I am, pure I am is pure sense of being. And that pure sense of being, you will be able to appreciate only when your consciousness is free from cravings for the outer things. So, you have to uh, give up all these cravings. There is a formula. Which ones should we give up? Which fragrances should we give up? Which uh, uh, tasty dishes we have to give up? Which desires we have to give up? There is a formula. This formula I tried in uh, a few classes. I don't know whether you will appreciate it or not. You take this thumb rule. Whatever your mind feels of significance, some value, whatever your mind says this is valuable, that is worthless, give it up. That is the thumb rule. Suppose your mind says this particular dish, ladu, with a lot of sugar, oil and carbohydrate thing, it is very tasty, it is worth eating, and it is Bhagavan's prasadam also. This is a religious guy, he will add uh, that another element to that. <clears throat> so your mind says all this, you don't rely upon your mind. That is exactly what you do not want. Don't want it. Suppose you are thirsty, your mind says how nice would it be if we drink uh, some coke, etc. That is what your mind says. What your mind says is false. Don't rely upon your mind. When you are thirsty, you rely upon the intelligence of the body. Body wants water. Body operates by intelligence. Mind doesn't conduct the body. Mind messes up the body. Mind doesn't run the body. The intelligence runs the body. Intelligence of the heart runs the heart well. But it is the mind which messes up the heart. Mind, mind is the brain cells. It comes out with an intense desire. And that sends some chemical messengers from the brain to the heart, acetylcholine or whatever. And then the heart starts beating fast. And you do that a few times, your heart will be in trouble. Therefore, mind doesn't run the heart. Mind messes up the heart. Your digestion and your uh, gastrointestinal system 
ఇట్ ఈస్ రన్ బై ఎ బ్యూటిఫుల్ ఇంటెలిజెన్స్ గాడ్ రన్స్ ఇట్ బట్ యువర్ మైండ్ ఇట్ మెసేజ్ ఇట్ మైండ్ వాంట్స్ స్పైసీ డిషెస్ ఆల్ కైండ్స్ ఆఫ్ స్పైసీ ఆయిలీ రోస్టెడ్ ఇన్ ఆయిల్ డిషెస్ దిస్ రోస్టింగ్ ఇన్ ఆయిల్ ఇట్స్ ఇన్ ఏషియాటిక్ ఎబరేషన్ ఇన్ ఫుడ్ యూ షుడ్ నాట్ ఈట్ ఆయిలీ ఆయిల్ రోస్టెడ్ ఫుడ్ it has lots of peroxides and all that oil is fatty acid and you take the oil and put the fire underneath and um, and the oil is getting heated up okay so it reaches 350 degrees centigrade or so before you can take vada out of it it was reach 300 degrees or so and so your vada is coming out of an oil which is boiling lot of fumes will be coming and those fumes are very painful if you inhale those fumes you will feel the irritation in the eyes nose etc that's why you put an exhaust exactly above the boiling oil so that every wisp of a fume is taken away by the exhaust and thrown out why you want it to be thrown out you inhale all that you call it food eh? you enjoy all that you will become sick in 5 minutes if that fumes are allowed to spread in the room so if they are so painful and dangerous now how come you take food out of that boiling oil and then you consume it how can there will be plenty of peroxides in that oil you, you should not uh, eat that food you may use oil when it is at room temperature in the cold you can use some fat you need you can use it but not when it is boiling so but people unless there is a lot of oil that to roasted so you want dosha yes dosha ordinary roast or extra roast extra roast it is not good for health certainly not good for health most of these dishes are bad for health so you should be very moderate in eating these dishes uh, in eating food in general and you have to examine your entire menu and make appropriate modifications you have to do that therefore uh, so nothing i started somewhere and digressed nothing the mind wants is of much value that is the general principle so you you desire the best highest happiness greatest freedom that is what you should aspire for that is the brahma jignasa brahma jignasa means greatest uh, freedom highest happiness and uh, desirelessness is the highest bliss therefore hitva ashwan all these uh, you see there is the body and all these sense organs are uh, fixed to the body body is the scaffold to which the sense organs are fixed it is a marvelous arrangement of nature and so don't try to use it for uh, securing pleasure don't do that because uh, they are not meant for seeking pleasure from the world they are meant for keeping the body in good shape as long as the body lives and so only take that kind of service from these sense organs otherwise what happens all our energies get scattered over many contradictory pursuits or desires and pursuits so you look at your mind when there is no desire in the mind and also when there is no fear in the mind what is the state of the mind and there is no fear and there is no desire the mind is silent look at that that is the beauty of that means it is the, the wind of desires that disturbs the mind and of course fear goes along with it pleasure and fear they are together they are two sides of the same coin pleasure and fear you seek pleasure you gain fear you acquire fear you cannot avoid it in seeking pleasure there is fear you see some of these religious leaders 
I'm not giving the example of worldly people. What is there to give example of worldly people? The religious leaders, they want the name and fame. They want to, to acquire the status of a celebrity. They want name and fame. They want a lot of clout in this society. That is how the religious leaders function. And therefore, they have this fear which never leaves them. They are constantly harangued or bothered by the fear of some bad name coming to them. Because everybody is a human being. To every is human. Huh? And therefore, they have to present a posture, carefully crafted posture or appearance before the public. And what they are behind the scenes, dekhna prata hai. Behind the curtain, what is this person? A very different person. This is how the religious leaders live. Why? What is this problem for them? Why not they be like, uh, life is an open book? Why not be like that? Because they seek joy or pleasure in the celebrity status. They seek clout in the society. That is what they are seeking. That is what they desire. Because they entertain the desire, they are constantly buffeted by the fear of getting a bad name. That's the point. Therefore, the moment you have pleasure in uh, your name being, uh, you get a celebrity status and you enjoy it. There is pleasure in it for you. Along with that pleasure, there is the fear of getting, uh, getting scandalized. That fear is always haunting these uh, big leaders. It is always there. Very funny thing it is. Therefore, so you do not pursue any desire whatsoever. You will not know what is trouble. Therefore, the world is a board of desires and fears, you have to understand. Atma, the inner uh, sense of being, is the abode of happiness infinite. Bliss, that is the abode of bliss. And the security, if that is what you want, that is where you have all the security of the world. The world has no security. The world has no joy to offer to you. The world is a board of desires and fears. The world here, it is like that. The world hereafter is also like that. Sarge loke, bhogan bhukva sarga loke vishale, kshine punye matya lokam vishanti. Once the punya is exhausted, the merit is exhausted, it is like you are in a, a five-star hotel, enjoying uh, life in a room, and but the clerk below, the, the receptionist, uh, those people will be there, you know, he notices that your credit card has no credit left in it, and therefore you, the credit card is not getting money for them. They notice it is not getting uh, accepted. Red light comes. Once he sees the red there, then he will immediately send a servant or an attendant to, you, to evict you out. Therefore, uh, <clears throat> the world is like that. It is a very cunning world and uh, full of contradictions, a board of desires and fears. That is what it is. And so you don't rely upon the world. Hitva. You interact with the world through the sense organs. World is sense objects. World is sense objects. The sense organs are the, um, the portals or the windows through which you enter into the world. Don't do that. It will hurt you. You give up the world and be a happy person. So that is the verse. Let us say the verse one time. So, apramatta, pramatteshu, as the people around are inadvertent, I am giving word to word meaning. Is that okay? Pramatteshu, as the people around 
ஆர் இன்வர்டென்ட் அப்பிரமத்த பி அலர்ட் தட் இஸ் வாட் யூ சுட் பி சுப்தேஷு as the people around are in deep slumber deep you need not say slumber is enough as the people around are in slumber bahujagaraha be completely awake sumedha be very intelligent don't be a muddle headed person to pursue happiness in the world only muddle headed people the ignorant people pursue security and happiness in the world it is not there there is no security in the world there is no happiness in the world okay so then why do you take medical insurance for a practical reason we take it we have a medical insurance for a practical reason medical insurance will not make you healthy okay for so practical re pragmatically you have to you may want to have a medical insurance but don't rely upon medical insurance to give you health security he says that yogakshemam mahamyaham he says don't believe in that that won't make you happy and healthy only you can make yourself happy and healthy by keeping the inadvertence at bay so be intelligent sumedha So let us say, Sumedha, an intelligent person, Yati, moves forward. How Ashwan, uh, the horses, Hitva, having given up. That is how an intelligent person moves forward. So, you see, it is evening 6 uh, you sit and meditate don't sit and drink coffee and mysore bhaji don't eat mysore bhaji and drink don't do that sit and meditate now by 7 7:30 you have full uh, uh, hunger and uh, take some simple light dinner so when you go to a hotel at 6 all the hotels are full of people at 6 o'clock that is the meditation time that is not eating time that is how the world is pramatteshu so hitva to give up to give up all these worldly things so then how an example yatha in which way javanaha the fast traveling the fast wayfarer wayfarer which is, who is traveling fast javana durbalan ashwan gives up weak horses so a wayfarer who has to cover a long distance and who has to travel fast he won't keep weak horses he gives them up and he moves forward the metaphor you know metaphor don't ask questions about horses fast don't ask any question yeah. once i i gave an example of electricity i still remember in anaikathi so i gave the example of electricity in my class then a brahmachari got up and a brahmachari some student got up and asked me a question about electricity i said i don't entertain electricity questions sit down <laughs> i am not a electrical engineer i may be able to answer but i don't entertain that question it is not about electricity what are its charges how many phases will be there two phases three that is not the discussion <laughs> okay so similarly here also what about horses if he gives up the whatever horses are there if he gives up then what he will do will he walk or run no that is not the way to look at it okay <laughs> so i have a poem from swami ramatertha that king pin of vedantins ramatertha you have to mention where ramatertha only when you say vedanta you have to mention ramatertha he the king pin of vedantins he says go forward without a path see that 
बिकॉज सेंस ऑफ दम शब दी हार्सेस एंड सेंस ऑफ जिट शब दी पार्ट्स दे आर दी पार्ट्स सो यू नीड ए पाथ एंड वेन यू नीड ए पाथ टू रीच दी गोल देन यू नीड ए हार्स ऑल्सो नो हियर यू डोंट नीड ए पाथ दिस इज ए पाथलेस जर्नी a timeless journey in a pathless land you don't need a path hmm? you need attention you don't need a path you don't get a path don't look for a path path stands for method don't look for a method to meditate or to self realize there is no method um, therefore uh, seeking a path seeking a technique seeking a method in the name of yoga etc do yoga by all means you should do but in the name of yoga seek any of these things they are all same seek a path you miss the goal you don't get you miss the point there is no path this is pathless land self realization is pathless land and is a timeless journey therefore he says go forward without a path means you don't need a sound or a form to reach moksha there are the paths you know then he says fearing nothing caring for nothing the moment you care you fear caring implies fear care war no faces the care is fear eh? so attachment and fear so without uh, fearing nothing caring for nothing then he says wander alone there is the travel he is describing wander alone like the rhinoceros the rhinoceros you can even say like the lion once i was uh, in a safari in a forest area i was there so early morning there is the time to see animals then suddenly i saw a lion Generally, people see lion in a circus song or in a movie, but a real lion, and it is going majestically in its own way. It did not look at us; we were uh, uh, awestruck to see it. Majestically, it is going. It is going alone, and we waited and waited. Suddenly, it has disappeared behind a bush, few bushes. That is the lion. It is always alone. So, I am ever Murugan Dratta. Don't be like a, an elephant. An elephant is the most frightened of the animals. An elephant is the strongest animal in the entire creation. Most powerful animal in the entire creation. At the same time, it is the most frightened of all animals. That's why. elephants always move in herds generally you don't find single elephant unless it has lost its way and when four elephants are sleeping one elephant keeps a watch when uh, these elephants are domesticated in some places they are also if there are four of the elephants three are sleeping one is keeping watch we domesticated body but is there to keep watch but still they are like that they are the, that is the samsara samsari sir frightened people very very much afraid very much afraid so because they are afraid because they have too many cares caring for this caring for that therefore they get fear so here the mahatma says fearing nothing caring for nothing wander alone like the rhinoceros even as the lion not trembling at noises that is what he says when there are noises in the forest all kinds of noises will be there but lion walks majestically without trembling at all these noises be like that the world there will be so many noises in the society society is very noisy so don't uh, you get concerned or frightened by all those noises even as the wind not caught in a net you cannot catch wind in a net you can catch fish in a net but not wind you can water wind you, you cannot catch wind in a net therefore uh, 
so mahatmas are like that they are not caught in the net of worldly pleasures and wealth and all that that net they cannot catch them be like that be like the wind that cannot be caught in a net even as the lotus leaf unstained by the water it is like apramatta pramatteshu there are all worldly people around live in the middle of them don't run to rishikesh or uh, this place or that if you have some purpose there you can go nothing wrong but not you should not escape see whether you are escaping if you are not escaping it's okay escape in a in a given case escape is allowed by the smruti karas sanyasa is allowed as an escape by the smruti karas in some very special circumstances so like a bankrupt bankruptcy is there in america bankruptcy law is there is it called 411 or something name is there for that so it uh, what is that number for uh, chapter 411 huh? ah chapter 11 not 411 chapter 11 so chapter 11 is an avenue available for a totally hopeless person he lost hopelessly and he has a no avenue to recover the money and pay back the dues etc he has no hope at all totally hopeless then he applies chapter 11 so that the debtors don't bother him don't come after him that is america chapter 11 in india chapter 11 is sanyasa it is it is it is, it is allowed is a monosmruti kara gave permission when you are totally lost totally hopeless then I tell your family members to fend up because he becomes a burden to the family members they are better off without this guy therefore tell them to do namaskar to them tell them and go and take sanyas it is said like that or suppose there is a terminal disease no hope of recovery take sanyas and live the life of a lonely person don't be a burden upon like that an escape is allowed in a very extreme cases in the case of sanyasa the only allowed there normally escape is not the way for self realization people should understand to become a sanyasi not as a way of escape Are you study Vedanta, devote yourself to it, not because you want to escape from the world. It should not be like that. You choose to tread that path. Therefore, even as the lotus leaf unstained by the water, do thou wander alone like the rhinoceros. That is the verse. Let us say the verse and complete it. Apramattah pramatteshu. ಅಪ್ರಮಾದ the lightness if the seeker is earnest the light he will get the light of wisdom can be given and he will get it also so the light of wisdom the self realization is there always and it is there for all it is not uh, reserved for some special people or any such thing it is always there and it is uh, given uh, for all but the seekers are few most of the people are pramatteshu supteshu like that they are apramattah is always singular and apramattah because seekers are few and among those few those who are ready are very rare and you can be that rare person that is the point and that is the apramada 
So what is this Apramada? The heart must be ripe. The mind must be ripe. That uh, maturity or the ripeness of both heart and mind is indispensable. You cannot dispense with it. What is the ripeness of the mind? Mind ripeness is there is no happiness in the world. Happiness is only in my Swarupa and mind knows it. That is the ripeness of the mind. Then, uh, what is the attachment? Re kate kanta kaste putraha samsaroya mativa vichitraha. Shankara says, this worldly pe- Shankara looks at the worldly people. Uh, sometimes it sounds as if he is very condescending also in a right way. So, he, what are all these worldly people? He says, my wife and my son. Are, who is your wife and who is your son? You have entered into this world with wife and son or what? Huh? Catch hold of a lady and say, my wife and a child is born in the world and you say, my son, kya baat kar rahe, bhai? Why people talk this kind of language? Kate kanta kaste putra. But they continue that. They won't get the message. Then Shankara gives up and says, Samsaroya Mativa Vichitra. This is a very funny place. And people are nuts. Nothing more than nuts. They are crazy. This is a funny world. This is a mad, mad, mad world. You know what I mean? That is what it is. Therefore, you all this you understand. That is the right mind. But all I said till now, you understand it. You don't have an issue with it. Yeah, that is true. You say that. That is the right mind. Then right heart. You love your adversary. Okay, people are people. So, two brothers are fighting about property. One of the brothers is ignorant and therefore greedy. He wants a bigger share. The other brother is intelligent and wise. He says, dear brother, take it. The elder brother is greedy. The younger brother is uh, um, magnanimous. He said, what is there? Okay, some extra property your uh, elder brother will enjoy. He is greedy. He doesn't want to understand. He doesn't want to be fair. Let him be unfair. I bless him and I forgive him. That is the ripeness of heart. So I gave only examples. There will be many more such examples just to make a point. What is the ripeness of Suppose I say the mind and heart should be ripe. What does it mean? And that is what I have explained. You should have that love, magnanimity, forgiveness in your heart. Just forgive. Always think the good of the other person. The other person may be doing good to you or may not be doing good to you. Sometimes we be doing harm to you. But still, we think good of the other person. That is the ripe heart. Type mind, it clearly sees things as they are. So people, they imagine things, they don't know how to see things properly, correctly. They only imagine, like pot, it is pot. What is imagination? Murtiketcheva satya. So people imagine, they don't know. In fact, people only stare, they don't know how to see. They don't know how to see, they only stare. Stare is what Namarupa. See the Tatvam, they don't know that. And then uh, they hear, they don't listen to. They don't know how to listen to. They just hear. So, therefore, uh, the, the ripeness or maturity of the heart and mind, uh, they are indispensable. They are very important for the seeker. That is the Apramada. We have finished the verse. Let us say the verse and conclude. Apramatta pramatteshu supteshu bahujagaraha sumedhayati hitvashvan turbalan javano yatha That leaves just one more verse or two verses. One verse, yeah. Just one verse is left. In 
that varga we will finish it we will uh, look at it tomorrow morning yeah so apramadra to bhikshu we will do that very beautiful verse that om purnamada purnamidam purna purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate om shanti shanti shanti